one day in late September of 1954, age seven and a half, I had a cold or a flu and I had to stay home from school. And the first game of the World Series was broadcast on television that day and I watched it. And this was the game in which Willie Mays made the most famous catch in the history of the sport. Running, 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 running hundreds of feet to catch a ball over his shoulder with his back to the, to the field. Magnificent catch. So he became a hero for me because I thought I had never seen anything more spectacular than that catch. So the following spring, the next season, 55, uh, my parents had friends who had season tickets to the Giants games, which were played in a place called the Polo Grounds, which again, no longer exists. It's been demolished. It's uh, only a memory now. Um, so we went to a game, it was a night game. We sat in the box seats. And after the game, as we were leaving the stadium, there was Willie Mays standing in his street clothes already. And uh, I, I, I remember feeling, he was 24 years old, just think, 24. And I, I timidly went up to him and said, Mr. Mays, may I please have your autograph? And he said, sure, kid, sure. Got a pencil? And I didn't have a pencil. My father didn't have a pencil. My mother didn't have a pencil. Their friends didn't have pencils and no one had a pen. And then Willie Mays said, sorry, kid, ain't got no pencil, can't give no autograph. And then he left. And I was really very upset, I have to say, shaken. I was so disappointed. So disappointed that I actually cried in the car. It's a stupid response, but it was a big, big moment for me. After that day, I always made sure to walk around with a pencil in my pocket or a pen because I didn't want to be caught unprepared again. And then I conclude, as I like to tell my children, that's how I became a writer. I ask whoever is listening to this voice to forget the words it is speaking. It is important that no one listen too carefully. I want these words to vanish, so to speak, into the silence they came from and for nothing to remain but a memory of their presence, a token of the fact that they were once here and are here no longer, and that during their brief life they seemed not so much to be saying any particular thing as to be the thing that was happening at the same time a certain body was moving in a certain space, that they moved along with everything else that moved. You know, all through my youth, um, and, you know, into my 20s, uh, I was trying to write novels then. And I must have written oh, 1,000 pages, 1,500 pages of aborted novels, things I could ne never finish, uh, piles and piles of manuscripts. Um, and this, is, this was my, my apprenticeship. This is how I, you know, I learned how to put sentences together never published any of that stuff. But some of those ideas later resurfaced in books I published later when I was older and capable of doing it. So for me, it was very slow. Early on, I could write poems because they were short, but longer forms were uh, too difficult for me. Now, it's also instinctive. I'm barely aware of what I'm doing. But at the same time, I don't write fast and I've never written fast. Um, for me, a good day's work, and this is eight hours of work, a good day's work is if I have one typed page at the end, one. Two pages is great. Three is a miracle. You know, it happens maybe four times a year that I can do three pages. But if I can get the one page done, I feel, I feel satisfied. And so that means generally writing a passage 10 or 15 times, uh, going over and over and over, fixing the sentences, you know, trying to hear the rhythm. Um, and uh, until, until it looks like a piece of music, effortless, smooth, 
um, with the energy that I want. Um, and uh, that's the work. The hard work is in trying to make it look easy.